A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis, brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 12th of September 2021. So we have eight articles chosen for discussion today. The last article, however, as you can see, was discussed extensively yesterday. So we are not going to go over it again. For any doubts, you can actually go over for the yesterday's video and you can refer to that particular part of the discussion. But we will be discussing seven other topics in detail. The first topic that we have chosen will be based on account aggregators. See, this is an important topic especially for understanding and because RBI has released a framework regarding that. So we will be seeing what is an account aggregator and how will it be useful for the economy. The second part of the discussion will be based on Myanmar. See, it is a map based discussion. And this particular part of discussion will also be useful for those aspirants who are appearing for this preliminary exam because Myanmar has consistently been in news for quite some time now and map based question from Myanmar is a potential area for the UPSC. And the next part of our discussion will be based on the modified guidelines for treating hypertension released by WHO. In that context, we will be discussing how does the blood circulation in the heart actually works and what is hypertension. So this is again a static topic which is very relevant even for those students appearing for preliminary this time. And apart from that, we will be seeing something called as ORCA, alright, it is a small snippet topic. So for those who are curious, just stay tuned with us until we reach there and the next part of our discussion will be based on the fundamental forces. Apparently, there has been a discovery of a new force which is the fifth force. We all know we have four fundamental forces which is gravitational force, we have two nuclear forces which is strong force, we have weak force and apart from that we also have electromagnetic force. And apart from that we also have the fifth force apparently which has been newly discovered. Let us see that in the course of the discussion and next part will be based on zero COVID strategy. A lot of countries, especially the Western countries including New Zealand, Singapore, they have abandoned the zero COVID strategy. Rather, they have switched to COVID resilient strategy thanks to the mutations that the virus is going through. So, it has been proving elusive for the humans to combat it completely. So, they have shifted the strategy. Let us see about this shift and the vaccinations and everything. And Next, we will be talking about the e-safety for the kids. UK has recently released regulations for the safe content in the cyberspace for the kids. And with that, we will be seeing about the e-safety for the kids from that particular article. And lastly, we will be wrapping up our discussion based on four practice preliminary questions. And in that segment, we will also be discussing one past year preliminary question from 2013 which is relevant to today's discussion and lastly we will see some mains questions and we will wrap up our discussion. So with that let us move on to the discussion for today. Now look at this FAQ article. See recently the Reserve Bank of India has launched an account aggregator framework. This framework is aimed at making financial data more easily accessible. So let us first understand what is account aggregator framework and how this account aggregator framework is important. So here is the syllabus relevant for this discussion. So first let us start with understanding account aggregators. See account aggregators are intermediaries. So what they will do is they will collect data from one financial entity and exchange it with another. See there are financial entities like banks and then we will have insurance agencies like LIC. We may have mutual funds. So they are all financial entities. Then we may have entities like SIBBI. We may have institutions like NABARD. They are all financial entities and one person A may take an insurance from LIC and the person may invest in the mutual funds and from the bank he may actually take loans or he may deposit something and so is the case with the engagement with CB and NABAR. So the person A's financial transactions are widespread be it with bank, be it with LIC, be it with mutual funds or be it with SIGBI, NABAR. So this account aggregators what they do is they connect the dots. 
they take the financial transactions from the mutual funds from the lic from the cb from the bank at a single point and this is the function of account aggregator okay so what is the use uh, say the bank is processing a loan application from a potential borrower so the bank may want to access a variety of financial data about this particular borrower say a and this is where account aggregators come into play see the lending bank can access details of the borrower's savings about the loan repayments about the mutual fund holdings about the insurer holdings through an account aggregator and the account aggregator would have the required details whenever asked for but it is important to note that the borrower should have given consent for sharing this data see consent is very important especially in the data age see data once lost is lost say you don't want to disclose an information or your name and somebody else takes your name and they disclose your name so the world is not going to forget that this is your name so the data once lost is lost so that is exactly why consent is very important in the data age so coming back to the article so the borrower should give consent to the account aggregator for sharing his data with the lending bank so this is how account aggregators work now coming to the news see recently the rbi has launched a framework regarding the account aggregators and this framework will allow the financial data to be exchanged between the holders of data and its users now let us move on to the benefits of having an account aggregator framework see at the moment the financial data of an individual is scattered across various databases of several financial institutions like we just saw in the beginning of the discussion so a person's savings and loan data may be with the bank his investment data will be with mutual funds while his insurance data will be with the lic so this is why rbi has introduced the account aggregator framework under this framework all the financial data of an individual can be collected from one particular place that is account aggregator and it can also be easily shared through the account aggregators with the consent of the individual that is the bank who is trying to lend does not have to go to a mutual fund does not have to go to lic does not go to cb rather the bank can directly approach the account aggregator and get their loan processed so the lending process will also become easier and the people who actually are good borrowers they will get a better chance of getting credit rather than those who default so in essence this will make the financial decisions better especially regarding the loans so now some people may have a doubt we already have mechanisms like sibil pan to do the same task see sibil score is something that talks about the credit worthiness of an individual that is the individual credit behavior that is is the person repaying her loan is the person not repaying her loan will be reflected in the sibil score so we already have that mechanism now why do we need an account aggregator so the scope of the existing mechanism that is the sibil pan and all is very limited take for example sibil so we all know sibil gives the credit worthiness of the individual similarly take pan pan tracks the financial transactions of an individual but according to this article both their scopes are limited pan captures only a limited number of transactions which are of value higher than certain minimum threshold and similarly we have sibil which does not have access to all the financial data only the credit worthiness is reflected so the scope is limited this is why we need an account aggregator framework again so this framework will offer a wide array of data to the financial firms and this easy access to data will allow the financial firms to serve the eligible credit worthy population of our country that's what we saw earlier the person who will be repaying the loan on time will have a better chance of accessing the loan because there is more transparency the person can prove herself better through a aggregator framework also the account aggregators can also make life easier for credit worthy consumers by allowing them to share their financial data digitally with ease see you don't have to really run behind the aggregator with the papers you can just do it digitally itself the availability of wider financial data may also help financial institutions offer better product to the customers so 
there are two things see because a credit worthy individual is getting the credit the npa chances are getting lower so that is one major advantage is and apart from that the bank will also lend carefully the bank will not lend to people who are not credit worthy the bank will not lend to person who will default on their payments because of this transparent framework we all know the npa problem is a plaguing problem in india so in this scenario this particular setup is something very very beneficial so all this is good but there is a problem say the customers are worried about the security of the financial data with the account aggregators see the account aggregators they are nothing but data repositories they will store the data of the financial transactions of a lot of people at one particular point like i said data once lost cannot be regained so the people are worried about the safety of the data with the account aggregator what if the firewall gets breached and some malicious element has access to the data with the account aggregators so that is the worry with many customers so let us see what can be done for this first we can protect the privacy of the individuals by encrypting the financial data see the account aggregators should receive and share financial data only in an encrypted form so that the data theft does not happen during the transmission and this will minimize the risk of data theft in addition to that rbi should also ensure that the data ownership will reside with the individuals and this will increase the confidence of the customers see the account aggregators can be a game changer move but the eventual success of this framework depends on multiple factors and will major financial firms show interest in this framework will the customers be willing to share their financial data all these only time will tell and all these factors will contribute to the success of this framework as well so let us wait and watch so in this discussion we saw about account aggregators what are account aggregators how are they beneficial for the economy and how the data with the account aggregators can be protected we also saw that so keep this in mind with that let's move on to the next segment of today's discussion now let us take up this news article for our discussion so this particular article reports about a fighting in the magwe region of myanmar see this magwe region is in central myanmar now in this context let us quickly refresh our learning on the region of myanmar see myanmar was initially called as burma and this particular country is located in the western portion of the mainland southeast asia and it is a very population dense country with a population of about 54 million and note that the biggest city of myanmar is rangoon which is how it was formerly called and now it is called as yangon and its capital is naypyita as you can see from the picture myanmar is the northernmost country of the southeast asia and it is shaped like a kite right with a long tail that runs along the malay peninsula and now i'm talking about its bordering countries remember that myanmar shares border with china to the north and northeast and we have laos to the east we have thailand to the southeast we have andaman sea and bay of bengal here to the south and southwest and we also have bangladesh to the west and we have india to the northwest see also know about the states that border the myanmar see there are four states that border myanmar this includes first is arunachal pradesh we have nagaland we have mizoram and we have manipur again we have manipur here we have mizoram we have nagaland and we have arunachal pradesh see this arunachal pradesh we have tri junction area see beyond this point we have china and below that we have myanmar and this side is india so remember the states that border myanmar and as you can see from the picture the entire myanmar can be divided into five physiographic regions and they are northern mountains western range we have a plateau in the east and we also have coastal plains and apart from that we have a central basin and lowlands and see the northern mountains of myanmar consist of a series of ranges that form a complex knot at mount hakakabo and remember this region contains the source of several of asia's great rivers and this region also includes the birth of iravadi and the salween river iravadi is very important 
and remember iravadi rises and flows wholly within myanmar whereas salween that also serves myanmar rises in china and about 3/5 of myanmar's surface is drained by the iravadi and its tributaries at the apex of its delta the iravadi breaks up into a vast network of streams and empties into the andaman sea through the multiple mouths here it is see when we talk about iravadi it is also important to talk about iravadi dolphins see the iravadi dolphins are predominantly present in three rivers one is iravadi in itself in myanmar and we have mekong river and then we have the mahakam river and in the indian side it is found in the chilika lake in odisha we all know chilika lake is a lagoon and it is asia's largest and the world's second largest lagoon and in 1981 this lake was first declared as the ramsar convention remember that now coming back to the iravadi dolphin this iravadi dolphin is designated as endangered in the iucn red list so remember that now let us get back to myanmar remember that myanmar has got two major lakes one is indavgi and another one is inle lake just remember the names that is more than enough see regarding myanmar you will have to remember the countries bordering it and the states in india that border myanmar and uh, the most important river in myanmar iravadi you will have to know and besides that also remember a piece of information that mekong river forms a brief border between myanmar and laos so that is something very important and it also serves myanmar very briefly it's one of the longest river in the southeast asia just keep that in mind see myanmar is a friendly country of india's and uh, a close neighbor as well so map based question from myanmar is a potential preliminary exam area so keep that in mind with that let's move on to the next segment of today's discussion now look at this news the world health organization recently released guidelines for the treatment of hypertension and in this context let us discuss the non communicable diseases and we will also discuss about hypertension in detail which is mentioned in this particular article see first let us know what is a non communicable disease see this is all prelims oriented topic okay so pay attention see as the name clearly says it is a disease that is not transmissible directly from one person to another for example say parkinson's disease or we can say autoimmune diseases the autoimmune disease is where the immune response of the self is directed against the self so that cannot be transmitted from one person to another or consider heart diseases or strokes or for that matter cancer or diabetes these are some of the non communicable diseases so a disease is communicable only when it is caused by an external pathogen and it becomes non communicable when it is caused due to the malfunctioning of the organs that is already present in our body and see the ncds may be chronic or acute see a chronic disease is something that manifests over a period of time over a long time on the contrary an acute disease means it appears suddenly and lasts for a short amount of time so ncds can be chronic and acute and know that the ncds are the leading cause of death globally in 2012 alone non communicable diseases were responsible for about 68 percentage of all the deaths and this number is approximately 38 million and also it is important to note that half of the non communicable disease deaths were under the age of 70 and half were women so with the new lifestyle changes and everything the number of non communicable disease deaths are also increasing year by year so this is about non communicable diseases see the article also mentions about hypertension so in the context let us see hypertension which is relevant for our exam so in that context see this is a science and tech topic so first let us understand the normal functioning of the heart and then let's proceed on to know about the hypertension see we all know heart beats right we have like two sounds lub and dub let's see how they are produced in the heart so consider this as a heart okay so we have the right atrium right ventricle and the left atrium and the left ventricle so the right atrium and the left atrium they receive blood from the outside source and the right side of the heart has blood that is carrying carbon dioxide 
and the left atrium has blood that carries oxygen okay and here we have the tricuspid valve separating the right atrium and the right ventricle and we have the bicuspid valve separating the left atrium and the left ventricle now when the heart beats we have here two sounds so when there is a contraction in the heart we call it a systole so when the, there is a contraction the blood from the right ventricle and the left ventricle are sent outside the heart and when there is diastole the blood from the right atrium and the left atrium reaches the right ventricle and the left ventricle respectively so this is how the heart functions so just to send the blood outside through a vessel the heart contracts and that is called systole and when the heart relaxes to send the blood from atrium to ventricle it is called as diastole so as you can see the systole is where the pressure is exerted and diastole is where the heart relaxes see when the blood is sent out we have blood vessels so the blood goes through the blood vessels say in a hypertensive case what happens is before that let us understand the normal pressure so when the blood passes through the vessels this exerts some kind of pressure on the walls of the vessels and when they exert some kind of pressure on the walls of vessels we record it as the blood pressure okay and when this exertion of pressure over the walls of the vessel increases we call it as high blood pressure and when it gets beyond a range we call it as hypertension so this is how the blood pressure works and let us see the normal ranges of the pressure see generally we saw that systole is the pressure exertion right so that value will be 120 mm hg and diastole is the relaxed state so that value will be slightly lesser which is 80 mm hg so in the normal pressure is generally expressed as 120 by 80 okay and the pressure is qualified to be hypertension if the value exceeds 140 for systolic pressure and if it exceeds 90 for diastolic pressure okay and in the revised guidelines provided by the who the pressure should be targeted to be lower to 130 by 80 and for the patients with comorbid conditions this target should be further lower in order to reduce the mortality arising out of heart diseases so this is the latest regulation and apart from that they have further regulations as well we are not covering that because that is not relevant for our exam so that brings us to the end of this part of our discussion so in this we saw what is a non communicable disease we saw the normal functioning of the heart So what is a systole what is a diastole how does the blood flow in the heart and apart from that we also saw about the normal hypotensive range so with that information in mind let's move on to the next segment of today's discussion now look at this particular snippet article from the science page see basically it's a quick takeaway article but relevant to that we'll also be discussing few concepts which are environment related which is important from the preliminary point of view all right see we all know global warming is happening and the greenhouse gases are responsible for this particular global warming process we all know that so a quick recap on that first we all emit carbon related gases or the greenhouse gases which can be hydrofluorocarbon or chlorofluorocarbon or it can even be the basic co2 we emit that and it gets absorbed in the atmosphere and in the atmosphere when it is retained what happens is the amount of radiation that is being reflected from the earth it has been retained resulting in the warming of the earth's temperature so that is basically global warming we all know that and if you see the greenhouse gases most of them have carbon in them see look at the figure as you can see we have carbon dioxide and we have methane which is ch4 and we have pfc which has carbon we have chlorofluorocarbon which has carbon so as you can see about 5 out of the top 7 greenhouse gases they have carbon so as a strategy to reverse the climate change absorbing the carbon from the atmosphere is something very important and a lot of research has also been going through in this direction so in that context people try to capture the carbon from the atmosphere see here you will have to know two concepts the first one is carbon sequestration another is carbon capture see both these terms are interchangeably used we can say that carbon is sequestered from the atmosphere 
when it is done very naturally that is through plants see we know photosynthesis requires carbon dioxide so plants absorb the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they make their food so when plants they themselves absorb the carbon dioxide and when it is a natural process it is called as a carbon sequestration see we are attempting to absorb the carbon from the atmosphere by planting trees and yes that will be a carbon sequestration process okay next is the carbon capture see we call a particular technology as carbon capture if it is man made we try and attempt to capture the carbon from the atmosphere through some kind of scientific technology so carbon capture is an artificial technology whereas sequestration is a natural process so keep that in mind so according to this article carbon capture technology machine has been put into motion and this particular machine called as orca is the largest direct air carbon capture facility okay and as you can note this is located in iceland and you will have to remember this from the preliminary point of view see another fact that you will have to remember relevance to this is that it captures about 4000 tons of carbon dioxide per year so in one year it captures 4000 tons of carbon dioxide so this is the amount of carbon dioxide that we as earth people release in just 4 seconds so imagine the amount of carbon dioxide that we release in 4 seconds requires one year to be captured by the world's largest carbon capture technology so that is the detriment that we are creating to our planet earth so let us live responsibly and let us play responsibly so with that let's move on to the next segment of today's discussion now let us take up this snippet article this snippet article talks about a fifth fundamental force we already know four forces see these four fundamental forces and also the fifth force that is recently discovered they are all important for the preliminary exam so pay attention see there are basically four fundamental forces that is strong force weak force the electromagnetic force and the gravitational force see the electromagnetic force and the gravitational force operate at atomic and the molecular scales that is they operate at a bigger scale compared to the weak and strong force the strong and weak force they operate only at the nuclear scales that is very 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 small level so let us look at these things in detail first let us talk about gravitational force so this is something very often talked about isn't it see this is a force of mutual attraction see gravitational force is not something that you drop and it just goes down no that is not gravitational force that is very layman definition of gravitational force but gravitational force is an attractive force between two objects of masses that is gravitational force only acts between particles that have a property called mass and it is a universal force that is it is present throughout the universe and also every object experiences this force due to every other object in the universe for example we have a water bottle and have a marker these two they also experience the gravitational force or all the objects on earth experience the force of gravity due to earth that is exactly why when we drop something it travels towards the earth so it is what is called as attractive force then why does an earth travel towards something else because earth is a massive body it has higher gravitational force compared to anything else on the earth and that is exactly why earth attracts anything that is on the surface uh, also we have the moon where the gravitational force governs the motion of the moon as well and in this way gravity also governs the motion of bodies falling to the earth next is the electromagnetic force it is the force between the charged particles here we are talking about the electric charge see the electric charge is the basic property of matter carried by some elementary particles and this electric charge can be positive or negative so generally when these charges are at rest the force that is acting acts in such a way that if there are like charges they are repulsive let us say there are two positively charged particles placed close to each other they are just static in that case they repel each other okay and on the other hand if they are unlike charges say one is positive one is negative they tend to attract 
each other and when these charges are in motion the story is entirely different because they produce magnetic effects and this creates a magnetic field and gives rise to a force on a moving charge and in such a scenario generally both electric and the magnetic effects and their forces are inseparable and that is why this force is called electromagnetic force and next we'll see about strong force see this is also called as strong nuclear force so according to this one it binds the protons and the neutrons that is this binds protons and neutrons in a nucleus and is responsible for the stability of the nuclei understand this see protons are positively charged particles so keeping them together will be a challenge and here is where the strong nuclear force comes into play and they keep the particles together so you can imagine that this is the strongest of all the fundamental forces and further remember it is charge independent understand this because it acts equally between a proton and a proton say a neutron and a neutron and a proton and a neutron so irrespective of the charge the force acts to keep them together but there is one thing this force range is extremely small that is only when they are kept as close as they are in nuclei the force will act if not the force will not act and next comes the weak nuclear force see this one appears only in certain nuclear processes such as beta decay of the nucleus so what happens in a beta decay here the nucleus emits an electron and an uncharged particle called neutrino and one important fact to be remembered is that the weak nuclear force is not as weak as gravitational force but it is much weaker than the strong force and the electromagnetic force and its range is also exceedingly small because it is a nuclear force so the range will also be nuclear and researchers have been searching for a fifth force for long now and they agree that the fifth force complements the existing four fundamental forces and now the news is that the researchers have tried to set stringent bounds on the strength of a type of fifth force this type is being called as the yukawa force so you don't ha really have to know the details they are very technical for us just remember that yukawa force is the fifth force that is enough for the exam so we saw about all the four forces and then we also saw about the new discovery which is the yukawa force so with that let's move on to the next segment of today's discussion now let us take up this news article see this news article is a response from a renowned epidemiologist on the covid-19 strategies so in this context what we'll be looking at is zero covid strategy and we'll also look at why the countries have given up on the zero covid strategy and apart from that we shall also look into the concepts of elimination and eradication of the diseases and how vaccines are effective and how the vaccines should be administered so this is the topics that we'll be seeing under this particular article all right so recently many countries many developed countries have given up on the zero covid strategy so what is the zero covid strategy see under the zero covid strategy people and the government aim at having zero covid infection in their particular geographic area if you remember during the first wave the small island country adjacent to australia that is the new zealand had zero covid cases and the achievement was lauded across the world but that cannot be sustained says this particular epidemiologist why at some point of time the country will have to open their borders some point of time the people will move in and out of the country so in that case especially in this particular globalized world a country going without exposure to covid is almost impossible so the people will have the circulation of the covid virus among their population so the countries like singapore and all they swiftly shifted from zero covid strategy to covid resilient strategy so this covid resilient strategy what it aims is to achieve good amount of vaccination good amount of zero prevalence while minimizing the intensity of the disease that is a person or a group of people manifesting the disease 
will have very mild symptoms only like a common cold it will not be life threatening so people have shifted to covid resilient strategy from zero covid strategy all right so because a country cannot eliminate or eradicate covid people have shifted to covid resilient strategy now let us see what is eradication and elimination see elimination means some disease has been reporting very low incidence in the population which means it is eliminated from the particular geographic area so in that case the country will target eradication of the disease now what is eradication eradication means the particular infection its pathogen is not present in the face of earth at all that is no one will be infected by that particular disease again so we have already eradicated smallpox that is a human achievement and we are at the verge of eliminating lot of other diseases as well and coming to covid there is no question of eliminating so there is no question of eradication and so the countries have shifted to covid resilient strategy now this takes us to the question of the role of vaccines in the covid resilient strategy see now that breakthrough infections are becoming common that is the viruses manage to infect a person despite vaccination so an infected person will always be able to transmit the virus thanks to the mutations like delta variant and all so there has been an increasing incidence of the breakthrough infections as well and this is causing the spread of covid even in the vaccinated population so a lot of countries what they are doing is they are trying to add a booster dose despite taking two doses so a booster dose every month they say can minimize the incidence of the covid but this author says that covid can be eliminated only when we administer the basic two doses to all the population and the question of booster comes much later only therefore the countries should target giving the basic two doses to the people rather than focusing on the further booster doses being administered to the people and uh, the author also notes that there is no scientific backing as well for the efficacies of the third or fourth or fifth booster doses given to the population so this is about the article in essence so we saw about the zero covid strategy we saw about covid resilient strategy we saw about eradication elimination and we also saw about the vaccine efficacy among the population in determining the future trajectory of this infection all right so with that information in mind let's move on to the next segment of today's discussion now let us take up this news article for discussion now see children have traditionally been unsafe they were one of the vulnerable sections of the societies always and in the new age where the cyber space has become accessible to children the cyber space has also proven very unsafe for the children so on those lines recently the uk government has made an amendment to the data protection act of their country and through this amendment it has brought into effect the age appropriate design code or in other words it is called as the children's code so this code ensures a safe digital space for children especially while accessing the online services and this particular article is written in this backdrop it's more of an explainer of this children's code so the syllabus covered by this faq is highlighted here so first let's briefly see about the threats faced by the children online As per the findings of a research on the threats faced by the children, children were found to be targeted with graphic content just within 24 hours of creating their social media profile. Say a child called Somu creates a profile. He is aged 13. He creates a profile online, say in Facebook or in TikTok. He wants to make videos on TikTok. He creates a profile, and whenever you create a profile, you will also furnish your age. and for responsible digital space the facebook or instagram or tiktok should not provide this particular account with some harmful content which could be sexually explicit or which could be something which does not promote body positivity or which has a distorted image of self or some content related to suicide so a young person as young as 13 who is entering their teen age these kind of stuff can actually harm the mental well-being of this particular child and facebook or tiktok or 
any other social media platform for that matter they do not take responsibility they simply provide this particular account with the feeds that they normally provide to any other feeds so within 24 hours this particular child is exposed to these kind of harmful stuff and another major issue is that despite knowing the age of the children the sites or companies enable unsolicited or voluntary contact from the adult strangers so this is especially true in case of facebook and all where the page in itself has been created to socialize but this child has been exposed to a stranger who knows nothing about the child and the child can actually be manipulated by this particular stranger. So this is another risk that they pose. And apart from this, such platforms also recommend damaging content to the children. So when I say damaging content, it may include a lot of stuffs like materials related to eating disorders or extreme diets and others. And as we know, data forms the heart of the digital services that presently exist. And this data starts to generate right from the moment we start our online activity. See, the data is generated for all possible information right from where we start our choices or preferences. And when you closely analyze the set services like that of the graphic content, voluntary contact and the other concerned area that we discussed about, we can find that these are certainly not bugs. They are not shown to them by mistake. The point is these social media platforms they just do not care and they really don't want to regulate what is being shown to a child and what is being shown to an adult the responsibility that they vest on themselves to show contents to children is not realized and even if these services were not conceived with the intent of putting children at risk these content still end up reaching the children and thereby resulting in some irreversible damage that may actually cause to a children and see, the harsh truth here is that these services are purposely designed to increase and multiply the followers' engagement and activity. See, as I said, the child that creates this particular account could be 13. See, 13 is such a tender stage. The person is a child and also they are entering a teenage and they are going to see the world through the digital window. And the stuff that reaches this particular child through the digital window shapes the mentality, the thought process of the child and it will define the future views of this particular child. And just because they want to market something, they use this particular vulnerability to push their activity because it gives them revenue. And the generated data is later used to manipulate or persuade children for further revenue generation. Now, coming to the children's code that was enacted in UK, see the children's code or the age appropriate design code as we saw earlier consists of 15 standards which the online services need to follow. See, this code applies to all information society services which are likely to be accessed by children. So, when I say information society service, it refers to any service which is normally provided for remuneration at a distance by electronic means and at the individual request of recipient of services. And this could include all apps, programs, search engines, social media platforms, or it can even include the marketplaces. Then we can see the websites and also online messaging services. And apart from that, it also includes electronically connected toys and devices. And remember that unless the service provider is able to prove that children do not access the service at all, it is required for them to consider making changes as per the demand of the code. So this is a very progressive move. And note that this code applies to all companies that use data of children in the country, including in both UK and non-UK based companies. See, this is because primarily the aim is to make the entire architecture child friendly, not just the specific region. And also, if it is not based in UK also, the content can still reach the UK based children. So that is the rationale behind this. So to conclude, the need for special safeguards to children in all aspects of their life is in fact rooted in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child itself. And Already tech majors like TikTok, Instagram, YouTube have tightened the safety rules for children, even though it is officially in place only in the UK, thanks to the precedents created by the UK. And on that line, if these tech giants continue to universalize their safety architecture, then it is 
obvious that the children across the world would benefit from the code so basically they can actually create a safer digital space for the children so this is all about the code see you can code the age appropriate design code on your essay for that matter related to children or any question that asks you to describe about the child safety in the digital space so this is basically very relevant with respect to social issues topic so with that let's move on to the next segment of today's discussion so as the last article for today look at this see this particular article is about the performance linked incentive scheme yesterday in kitna ma'am's lecture she extensively covered it systematically so we are not going to get into that all over again if you have any doubts you can of course go back to yesterday's video and refer that so with that let's wrap up our article section now let's start off with our practice preliminary questions session in that we have four questions let's go over it one by one so this question asks which of the following countries are landlocked see in myanmar we came across the boundaries of that one of the country that is bordering myanmar is landlocked and that is nothing but laos see laos is landlocked and we know our neighbors bhutan and nepal are landlocked so bhutan is landlocked see consider uzbekistan now see uzbekistan is something very unique it is called as double landlocked country why is it called double landlocked because the countries surrounding uzbekistan are also landlocked and world has only two double landlocked countries one is uzbekistan and other one is liechtenstein so all these three are landlocked and bolivia is one of the landlocked countries from south america so the correct option is option d 1 2 3 and 4 moving on to the next question see in our course of the discussion we came across orca if you recollect see orca is nothing but the world's largest carbon capture technology and we saw that it can capture about enough carbon that we produce in 4 seconds in 1 year so this is something very significant and in fact an alarm bell in the context of climate change so remember orca as the carbon capture machine and which is the world's largest carbon capture machine as well and it's located in iceland now the next question this thing is about the blood pressure see in the discussion we saw about systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure so systolic blood pressure happens when the heart contracts whereas the diastolic blood pressure happens when the heart relaxes so let's go with the statement see diastolic blood pressure measures the pressure in your arteries when your heart beats see this statement is wrong because systolic blood pressure measures the pressure in your arteries when your heart beats and it is the diastolic blood pressure measures the pressure in your arteries when your heart rests between the beats so like i said when the heart relaxes it is diastolic blood pressure so the right answer is option d neither one nor two moving on to the next question this question is about the fundamental forces in nature see we saw about four fundamental forces and one new discovery so it's a three statement question let's go over it one by one both gravitational and electromagnetic forces can be attractive or repulsive see we saw in the discussion that gravitational force is always always attractive whereas the electromagnetic force can be attractive or repulsive so the first statement is wrong so we have been asked to identify the correct statement just by knowing this piece of information we can eliminate option a b and d and we can narrow down at c but still we'll still go over the statement the second statement states the range of gravitational and electromagnetic forces is infinite while that of strong and weak nuclear forces is short yes this statement is right both gravitational and electromagnetic forces they act even at very 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 long distances there is no way to escape these forces by moving away from them it just becomes weaker at a farther distance and it is strongest when you are nearer and in putting it mathematically you can say these forces never become zero on the other hand the range of uh, the nuclear forces that is stronger the weak force they are extremely small at the dimension of 10 power minus 15 so the weak and strong forces effectively become zero at a long range so this is what this uh, statement says the range of gravitational and electromagnetic forces is infinite while that of strong and weak nuclear forces is short 
Now look at the third statement. The weak nuclear force is the weakest of all force. See this statement is wrong as well. See the weak nuclear force is not as weak as the gravitational force, but it is much weaker than the strong force and the electromagnetic force. And we saw the strongest is the strong nuclear force, right? So by order we can say that first comes the strong nuclear force, then we have the electromagnetic force, then we have the weak force and then we have the gravitational force. So gravitational force is the weakest of all the forces. And this tabular column also will help you understand the strength of these forces. So with that, let us also see a past year preliminary question. See, this question was asked in preliminary exam 2013. So this question goes like that. The known forces of nature can be divided into four classes. This gravity, electromagnetism, weak nuclear force and strong nuclear force. With reference to them, which one of the following statement is not correct? So we have four options. First one is that gravity is the strongest of the four. So we saw that gravity is the weakest of the four. So just by reading the first statement, we can arrive at the answer. But let us also see the other options. B says electromagnetism acts only on the particles with an electric charge. Yes, we saw that because it is about positive and negative charge. Next, we see that weak nuclear forces cause radioactivity. Yeah, it is a nuclear force, right? So that is also right. And the last statement strong nuclear force holds protons and neutrons inside the nucleus of an atom. We straightforward saw the statement in the discussion. So the right answer is option A. Gravity is the strongest of the four. So keep this in mind. So those are the practice preliminary questions. And here are some of the main questions inspired from our discussion today. Write the answers and post it in the comment section for peer review. Like I always say. So Let's wrap up our discussion for today. We are masked. Stay safe. Good day.